the second day of the senior design presentations. We're going to start with our team number six of mechanical engineering, which basically comprises of a PSGC design challenge for NASA. And this year they made a really, really good impression. They still have another competition to go. They promise they will win. I say they win, they pass. So I think it's a little bit of a right there. But otherwise, team number six, please stop. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I know that at least the guys in the back know that there's nine days left. That's our magic number. Nine days left until we wish our teammates the best of luck. <laughs> Group six, also known as Team Nikes. Uh, I'm Carlos. By order of appearance, we have Devada, we have Chris, Andy, and Elvis. Um, we're going to talk about about why we are doing this, why we did this, what we did. You know, a little bit about financials, how much it costs, uh, the um, givens that were uh, given to us, the uh, tolerances, the parameters, the iterations of the design that we went through, and a little bit of desktop testing and uh, real-time testing. So, the, what, why are we doing this? So, the, we had, the team had an idea of applying for this challenge. We applied to NASA through PSGC, we submitted a proposal, and uh, we submitted a design. We were accepted to participate in this competition. So we got together after a bunch of happy hours, we came up with something that we could deliver. We went a couple of weekends ago, we had the opportunity to compete at uh, somewhere close to NASA. We spent the whole weekend there, and uh, fortunately enough for us, we came out, we were judged in four categories. We were top five in each one of them, and we walked away second overall out of all of these universities out there. So um, what is it that we're doing? So the challenge was that NASA, what they do, the astronauts and the ISS, they perform extracurricular activities. They go outside of ISS, they perform maintenance, repairs, uh, material testing, and whatnot. So they want something that they can attach to the ISS and record the activities so they can have communications with Houston on real time. So right now, what, the, what they're doing is the astronauts have cameras, right? So they have them on their helmets, and whenever they move, those cameras move with them. They also have these cameras attached to the ISS but they're fixed. So if they are working in a confined space, they have no visibility. So they cannot communicate with Houston. So we came up with something like this. And this is what we presented. Um, came to find out that NASA likes electricity, so they enjoy this product. Uh, so how much did it cost to us? So we did a, an analysis uh, about how much it costs. So real money, uh, labor, and Material manufacturing was a little bit over a thousand dollars just to create a prototype, so it can be tested. It will be tested. So, uh, considering the five hundred design and whatnot in assembly, we're looking at about a twenty-seven thousand dollars investment just to create one. Since this is not going to be a commercial product, but we also went ahead and projected it if uh, you know it was going to be commercial. So, the number to manufacture a thousand units is probably around five hundred. So that's how much it would cost uh, if it was to be commercialized. Team Mackey's key objective was to design and manufacture a camera mounting mechanism that appears to multiple interfaces. Three of those interfaces are the ISS hand rail, the truss frame, and the seat cart square grid rail. The ISS hand rail is the most commonly found interface on the exterior of the ISS. It's a rectangular profile that is one and three eighths inches by five eighths inches. The seated cart square grid rail is a square one inch profile that's chamfered on the edges, resulting in an octagonal shape. And the ISS truss segment is 5.8 inches wide by three eighths of an inch deep. Uh, although NASA only required that we attach to two out of three of those interfaces, Team Mekis came up with an ingenious solution that attaches to all three by um, using the head profile and cutting out the shapes of the different interfaces. 
Some of NASA's uh, requirements were that we have a safety feature so that if the attached, if the mechanism comes off of the interfaces, uh, from that it would still stay on there so that we have to have a safety feature. Then also, we had to have a two-fault tolerance so that if there's a failure in the mechanism, that it would still uh, work at 50% and to have minimal pinch points. Then also for the material selections, uh, there's typical engineering metal alloys and then there was specific uh, lubricants and adhesives as well. All right, let's talk about the design phase. So the initial design consisted of a cylindrical body and a telescoping head. This was in an effort to minimize pinch points. Uh, this was this, it, pinch points that could be due to the internal moving mechanism, as well as the sharp cutout profile of the jaw. Why is that important? Well, think about how costly it might be if you puncture a spacesuit. So that cutout profile, as Nevada mentioned earlier, is what allows the design to attach to all three interfaces. That includes the handrail to the right, seat of cart, and truss segment. At the end of the design is a flexible camera attachment arm. This allows the astronaut to communicate visually with ground control on what they're working on. Now, although this design, it worked, it worked very well, uh, there was one major flaw in that it had poor ergonomics. It was difficult to use. So to address that issue, simply we simply attached the handle to it. Now, attaching the handle manipulated all of the internal working mechanisms to it. It was a complete ground up rework. Although this did improve the ease of use, it actually brought up a new issue, which was possible strain with prolonged usage as this kind of movement, this motion of squeezing, is actually not good over the prolonged usage of time. This brings us to the final design, which threw out all the bad stuff and kept all the good by incorporating what we call a lever handle, which simply activated with the palm of the hand with a simple push and pull. Very easy to use. Also, we decided to scrap the cylindrical body for a rectangular body. This allowed for a larger surface area, which allowed for actually better clamping forces, as well as more points of contact to mount the cameras to. And also, that shape is just easier to handle for an astronaut. Now, the flexible camera arm was switched with a ball stack attachment that you may see here. This checks all the boxes for all the flexible needs in terms of camera usage that they may need. So the final design, we actually developed two prototypes. One was made out of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. This has a very similar density to water. That is very important because the prototype, that particular prototype, which is shown here in white, is going to be going to be tested at the neutral buoyancy lab, which is pretty much a I think it's a 4.6, million gallon pool. And that's important because it allows them to use the prototype in something that simulates microgravity. Now the neutral buoyancy lab is where astronauts go to train and, be, and to train uh, for missions for the ISS, the International Space Station. The second prototype made was the one that's provided here. It's made of all aluminum. This is more of a final finished product, which would be going to NASA to be tested and whatnot and it's for the TSGC competition, which we placed second place, as Carlos mentioned earlier. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Andy, who's gonna talk about some safety features. So uh, the safety is, is one of the important things in our design. So the first one is two-fold tolerance. So the two-fold tolerance, uh, the better say that this is the, the ability of the device to operate normally in the event of you know, one or two component fail. So that's why we come up with two concentric springs. So the first spring, springs have 100, 91 pounds is the maximum dose, and the second one has 110 pounds by the manufacturer spec to prevent the failure of the spring. Uh, the second thing that we based on the spring material, the coin numbers, and then the wide diameters, we are able to calculate the load of the spring that determine the climbing force. So the maximum of the main spring is 125 pounds force, and the second one is over 10 pounds force to prevent uh, in case that the first spring is failed, the second one is still keep the tool in place. The next thing is that the two operational safety features. So initially, we use the over center uh, design to keep the handle locked in place. And it's easier for the astronauts to operate because it's going to be require less force to operate the handle. 
Uh, but you know, the astronauts may hit the handle and it may disengage, so that's why we come up with a vertical strap, wrap it out the handle to lock it in place. And before milling our heads, so we make sure that it's nothing's broken, so that's why we use the FEA analysis. Does it force mistress to determine the failure of the parts? As you see in the picture, so this, this yellow arrow is that we apply 125 pound uh, loads in the inner surface that is st uh, static loads. And we have the stress concentrate is about over 12 KSI. And then when we compare with the U point of aluminum 6061 required by NASA, so we have the safety factor is over 3.2. NASA only requires for the tested structures, the safety factor is 2 and the untested uh, structure is 2.6 so we're sure that the head is not uh, going to fail when the astronaut operates the device. So we subjected our device uh, to underwater testing to recreate the simulation, the environment, that, the testing environment that the device will experience at the neutral buoyancy lab by the professional divers. As Chris had mentioned, the neutral buoyancy lab conducts underwater testing to simulate the sensation of weightlessness experienced by the astronaut. We subjected the device uh, to, we tested the device for the mounting ability to each of the interfaces, as you see here as it interfaces with the ISS handle. We provided multiple views to show how the device is able to receive each of the interfaces, as you see here. We continued our testing with the acetocar uh, square grid, which is, a, uh, which is a slightly thicker interface with a more complex shape having the octagonal profile, the device is able to accommodate this railing just as well as it did with the ISS handle. Here's a close-up as, as it interacts with the ISS, with the Cedar square grid. Our final interface was the ISS truss segment. Now this one was a little bit more complex since it's wider at six inches, it was significantly uh, different than the other two. But regardless of this white shape, it was still able to accommodate, attach, and secure with minimal effort. We provided, again, multiple views using the camera that was attached to it to show close-ups of how the device is able to be engaged. Next, we continue our testing with our two operational safety feature. This is the Velcro strap that loops around the handle. It secures the handle in the downward position to prevent accidental disengagement. This device was actually well received by NASA because they like the simplicity in it. So here we go, testing the device is able to secure the handle on the downward position and prevent uh, disengagement. We test the uh, camera's pitch, yaw, and roll adjustability to make sure that whenever they use it, they don't have any issues with that. And then we also showed how easy it is to remove the device. Just as easy as it is to put on, you can reverse the process by just unvelcroing and releasing the handle. Again, all these movements are gross movements with the hands. You don't require you to use fingers to be able to move uh, the handle, which is very, very welcome. So I want to thank also Dr. Garcia for that. Our next step is a new compliance lab this morning. Thank you all. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. How easy is it to fix uh, the device if something went awry? The device is actually pretty simple. By removing the back piece, everything is uh, modular. So whenever you're able to remove it, you're able to exchange the, the parts on the inside. Obviously, this was designed to not have to do that. Uh, so that's why all the fail, self, well, fail safe features were included into it. Uh, and to add on to that, um, we, were, we were asked by our mentor to actually test it 100 times. So one of our prototypes, which has the same components as this one, was tested over 100 times to make sure that nothing fails. And that's pretty much one of their standards. Any other questions? Any other questions? a little bit lighter than this one.
it goes in, in that forward position. So nothing, nothing will be in that way. It never exceeds the, the distance of the front. Any other questions? What would be the volume that would occupy on the base station? What would be the weight of the propeller system? Well, the, one of the requirements was it to fit in one of their bags, which was 12 by 18 by something. So that is 10 by 3 by 3. So that volume is 990 cubic inches. <coughs> the weight's less than 10 pounds, and their maximum weight is 15. So we were focused on what the requirements were to yes. be lower than the volume required. Just as a recommendation, every time you have a specification that you have to meet and you go low, you specify and we actually exceed the expectations by 20%. We actually reduce the volume consumed by 50%. We actually, every time, because that's part of sell the idea but basically configure something according to your specification. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more question. Is there any special training that the user has to have to be your pilot? So, good question. So on May 23rd, <coughs> we have written a set of operation and operations manual. So on May 23rd, an actual astronaut will go read that uh, manual step by step. He's going to memorize it, go underwater, and do it. And via radio, we're going to be, by, with the same manual, assuring that the steps are followed as we have written them. And if not, we'll be communicating with the natural aspect. So, so yes. Any other questions? material selection that they have. So the temperature differences, are they recommend the material that they have because they, those devices are already out in space. So uh, obviously we can't simulate the same uh, temperature differences that, you know, the radiation from the sun and stuff, but uh, we adhere to all the stuff that they had as far as material selection, which has already undergone that process by, by NASA and, and, and their people. Yeah, right. and I guess that may have that issue, and that would be the one, the, that flexible arm camera mount. Um, everything else is made out of aluminum. Uh, even that attachment points to it. So although we, we as Elvis mentioned, we stuck within the material list, we, uh, we, we made sure that the material that it's made out of did have, were strong enough to last a, a good amount of time in outer space. Now, our mentor did suggest that we did test it, but he, meant, he asked us to test it over a 100-day period, <laughs> which is something that we actually just recently received about, what, uh, two weeks ago? So we don't have 100 days to test it, but we would like to. Another thing would be, <coughs> would be basically, when you're talking about thermal expansion, the interface of both the springs, you know, that might you know, lock themselves to each other, and it will be maybe too strong to operate or too too slow, depending on how. Correct. Any other questions, guys? Thank you, number. Team number six.